Good morning, everybody. Um, when you know what it's like when the conference organizer asks you to give a keynote and you say, oh, that's a big honor, I'd like to do it. And Natasha asked me, well, this is a 10th anniversary. Um, can you use that as a part of the theme of your presentation? And uh, oh, by the way, can you also give me a title? And so by that time, you only have the vaguest idea of what you want to talk about. So you, you, know, you have to keep her happy. So you give some title. And, um, and then a few weeks later, you get what the French call this um, esprit d'escalier, which is uh, the, the ideas you get on the stairs walking up back home. And you know all the things you should have said. And then I realized uh, what the title should have been. So the title is not what it says in your program, something about universal patterns. Um, the title actually is 10 years of semantic web, does it work in theory? Right. Um, so um, what I want to do in this talk is look back at 10 years of our work. And uh, I'm not going to uh, celebrate our successes because they are so obvious they don't need to be stressed. It's obvious that we have done uh, a good job as engineers. We have built a really successful, very large artifact. But the question for this talk will be, uh, have we done any science? Okay, have we, besides building anything, have we learned anything? Anything uh, that is of a permanent value? Um, now, uh, this is going to be, no, by definition, this is a pretentious talk. Right, so it's always, at a science conference, it's always pretentious to talk about science instead of just talking science. Um, and uh, uh, with some trepidation, uh, I, I start this talk, and uh, I'm not the only one. So uh, uh, Jeff Norton, who is a, a leading uh, uh, researcher in the database field, uh, last year, I think it was at ICD 2010, he also gave a talk about science. In his case, it was about the scientific process and how we organize it. Um, and he started uh, with an introductory slide that I thought was very appropriate. So I've uh, freely uh, uh, borrowed this slide from him. So what he said was, uh, well, when he announced that he was going to give this talk to a colleague, so the first response he got from a colleague was, uh, cool, yeah, I, I look forward to it. And then he, he said this to another colleague, but then he also explained what he was going to talk about. And then the response was, ooh, how are you ever going to make this interesting? Um, and then he tried it on a third colleague. And the response was, uh, well, Jeff, uh, you've now reached the age where you're old enough to scratch your butt in public. So uh, go ahead. Um, and maybe the most disheartening response was when he, he, he announced his plans to a senior colleague, an emeritus. And the response was this, no, don't do it. Now, giving a keynote anyway means you are a washed up has been. So, um, but, but notice the flawed piece of logic in this, right? So even without giving the keynote, you could still be a washed up has been. Um, so in that case, you might as well give the keynote as well. Uh, so um, that's the plan. Um, talking about generic laws, generic laws of science, laws of computer science. Now before I, I can talk about generic laws of computer science, I, I need to make a, a philosophical confession, right? I need to explain to you where I stand on this idea of, uh, of, of what science is. So here's my view of science. Um, I'm a, what's called in philosophy a scientific realist. And I'm a, a, even a naive scientific realist. And maybe I'm even a happy naive scientific realist. So what is scientific realism? So here's a quote from the, the Stanford Handbook of Philosophy. It says, um, philosophical realism is the belief that our reality is ontologically independent from what we think. So it, the reality is independent from our conceptual schemes, from our linguistic practices, uh, from our beliefs. Right? I believe, like any scientific realist does, that there is a world that exists out there independently from us and that the task of science is to find the laws that govern that independently existing reality. Um, and there are other positions you can take. Right? So I'm not a constructivist. So a constructivist, and again, from the uh, Stanford Handbook of Philosophy, uh, constructivists maintain that scientific knowledge is constructed 
by scientists and not discovered. And so constructivists claim that, that the concepts of science are only our own mental constructs. Um, I do not believe it, right? I believe that there is a world out there that we can describe. Um, now, clearly you will recognize that realist view of, uh, of science, and, um, and it would apply to uh, sciences like physics, for example, where it's clear that it applies. Um, but um, how, um, how does it ever apply to, co to computer science? Okay. Well, just as with physics, I believe that uh, for computer science, there is an independently existing universe, the information universe, the universe of information, of knowledge, of data, um, and that this universe is governed by laws, laws about the structure and behavior of, of information and knowledge, um, and that we can discover these laws, just as we can discover laws about the physical universe. Um, and, and just like a, the physical universe exists independently from us, so does the information universe exist physically, uh, it, 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 it exist independently from us. Now, of course, the actual objects that we produce are of our own making, right? So databases, programming languages, but that's not different from physics. In the physical universe, we construct objects of our own making, uh, billiard balls, spaceships, nuclear power stations, but all these things that we construct, they are governed by laws that exist independently from us. And in the same way, the computer, the computing objects that we construct, they exist independently, they are governed by laws that exist independently from us, right? And it's our role uh, to discover the laws that govern this uh, universe of, of information objects. Um, so these information objects for me are real. They are not just our mental constructs. Right? Um, now, of course, it's true, it, it is the case that, that these, the way that we perceive these laws at any point in, uh, in history of our scientific progress, that the way we perceive these laws is, is colored by our own uh, subjective experience. Right? So what we perceive in the universe is, is colored by what we would like to see uh, or uh, by our cognitive limitations and by our cultural biases and even by distortions of our experimental apparatus. Um, but just that these laws, that we perceive these laws in a somewhat distorted way doesn't mean that these laws are therefore only our mental constructions, right? It's the role of science is exactly to chip away at these uh, distortions um, and to find out what the universe is, quote, really like. Okay. Now, of course, this analogy with physics is, uh, for a computer scientist, this, this analogy with physics is a bit pretentious, right? because uh, physics is a very mature science, and uh, it has a high degree of, of mathematization, and they have these very beautiful uh, formulas um, that they can write down in a very compact space, um, and it'll be a long time before computer science would ever reach the point where we have such beautiful mathematized uh, laws that you could write down in such a compact way. Um, and in fact, I think that computer science is not like physics at all yet. Uh, computer science is, and you may not like me for this, but uh, I think computer science is more like uh, alchemy, okay? Um, and uh, alchemy, uh, let me explain to you about alchemy. Alchemy is not just a, a bunch of medieval fools who were mistakenly trying to turn lead into gold. No, uh, historians of science talk about alchemy as a proto-science, right? It, they were genuinely trying to understand the world around them. Um, um, they were trying to, um, they were not even trying to find answers. Maybe they were even trying to just find the questions or maybe they were even just trying to find the types of questions that they should ask. And they were developing their conceptual schemas. They were developing their, their experimental apparatus. Uh, and then over the years, this proto-science turned into, into the more mature sciences like chemistry and physics. And I think it's very telling that uh, a figure like Newton was, was both foundational for modern physics and was an active alchemist. Right? And he, he thought of himself as an alchemist. Um, 
So, uh, so I think that this is more the state that we are in, but nevertheless, let's try now in the remainder of this talk um, answer this central question. Okay, so did a, a decade of semantic web work, did it help to discover any computer science laws? Okay. So the only way in which I can uh, answer that question is try to look at some of the laws that we may have discovered. So that's the, the program for uh, the next half hour or so, is to propose to you a number of laws that I think are computer science laws and ones that we may have helped to discover. But first, we should look at, uh, at what it actually is that we built, right? Uh, so what is it that we, that we built over these last 10 years? Now, I think at a very high level, uh, I think we can characterize what we built over the last 10 years in, in three ways. It's three parts, three components, if you want. So here's the first one, okay? So we built this whole set of vocabularies, right? Uh, and a whole lot of them, and maybe even more than we like, right? And not just the vocabularies, but also the tools uh, that we need uh, to, to build these vocabularies and the tools that we need to deploy these vocabularies uh, and the applications in which we use these vocabularies. But vocabularies are one of the three central pillars of what we built. The second thing that we built is a whole set of names, okay? So we gave names to everything and we call these names URIs. This is the house, this is the tree, this is my house, this is your house. Right? And we did this billions and billions, we minted billions of names for stuff. That's the second key ingredient of what we built. And of course, the third ingredient is that we strung all that, those vocabularies and those names, we strung them together in a giant network. Okay? So I think those three vocabularies, names, and a giant network are the, the essence at the very high level of, of what we built. But, and I, I said this in the introduction, Mostly we have been and we are thinking about what we are doing as an engineering effort, right? We're building this stuff and then we're checking if it works. And in a way it's obvious that it works. So I'm not going to spend a long time uh, celebrating our success, right? So all you need to do is, uh, is I have a slide deck at SlideShare uh, called Semantic Web Good News and take a look at those slides. And I, I keep updating them every time. So th there are there the stories about how the governments are now using our technology and not just the UK and the US only anymore. How the BBC is running their World Cup website with our technology. How the good relations ontology is changing the way the retail sector works. Um, how schema.org is pushed by the, the large search engines. How Oracle is including uh, RDF in its primary uh, database product how the publishing industry is changing with the New York Times, one of the leading lights. Um, so yesterday, uh, Ian Horrocks explained to me a project he's doing with uh, Electricité de France, where they are generating 300,000 personalized energy saving plans for people every day um, using uh, semantic web technology. And so it's clear that, that we have been an engineering uh, success. And then the question is, um, did we learn any science? And how am I going to answer that question? Well, the, the, the thought experiment I'm going to run is the following. So let's pretend that the last 10 years were one giant experiment, okay? They were one large, giant computer science experiment. Um, so this, this is, you know, we came out of a test tube. It was a, it was a giant experiment. What would happen if you would run that experiment again, right? So we did all this stuff. We designed languages, we built ontologies, um, we built DBpedia, uh, we built the linked open data cloud. Um, that's a giant experiment. Now what would happen if you would set back the clock and we would do it all again? Now then some things would turn out the same and some things would turn out different, right? And it's exactly that difference that I'm interested in. So the things that turn out the same they must somehow be of a crucial meaning, right? If you run the experiment again and again and some things are always the same, then they, they say something fundamental about the information universe. Now, some things are not very crucial. I mean, all our, I'll give you an example. So all our ontology languages are full of angle brackets. Okay? Now, I can imagine that if we would run the whole thing again, we wouldn't use angle brackets again, 
Right? So somehow the use of angle brackets doesn't strike me as a very fundamental law of computer science. Right? At least not one that I could imagine. Um, so that's a, an incidental choice. And if you run the experiment many times, you would make that choice in different ways. But other features would turn out the same and they would point to fundamental properties. Um, and then let's see what I think are some of these uh, fundamental properties um, to illustrate what I think computer science laws look like. And the good news is that we don't have to start from scratch. Right? So there are some well-known laws from computer science and, and these laws, we can also see that they apply uh, to our field. Um, so here's one. So this is a zip law, right? The long tail distribution. Okay? So, uh, you all know this, what does zip flow say? It says that, uh, okay, the, for some, f in many data sets and for some phenomenon of interest, uh, only a very small minority of the elements in your data set are responsible for the vast majority of the phenomenon of interest. And conversely, there is a vast majority of items that each only contribute very, very little to that phenomenon of interest. Right? And this is a well-known law, and we have also repeatedly observed it in our own community, and it's well documented uh, by a number of em uh, empirical studies. And, and this phenomenon, this SIP phenomenon, is, is both a curse and a blessing, of course. Now, it's a blessing if you're trying to do uh, compression algorithms, because pretty much all the compression algorithms exploit exactly this feature. But it's a curse if you're trying to do load balancing, like we have like we've been trying to do in our uh, parallel uh, computing uh, experiments. Right? Then if you try to do load balancing and the load is so unevenly spread, then it makes it very hard. Now, that's not the fault of Zipf's law that it's a curse and a blessing. Um, it's just that knowing Zipf's law helps you to realize when it is a curse and when it is a blessing. Right? So understanding this law of the information universe helps you to design your artifacts in a better way. Um, I'll give you another example of, a, of an existing law that, uh, from computer science that also applies to our community. So it's the, the inverse proportional relation between usability and, and reusability. Right? So anybody who's ever uh, wrote an ontology knows that there is this trade-off, that you can either make an ontology which is very specific for a particular domain, a particular task, easy to use for that topic, but it's very hard to reuse somewhere else. And conversely, if you make very generic, very high level, top level ontologies, they are very reusable. You can use them across many domains, but at a high cost. You really have to work hard every time you're going to use it for a specific case. And of course, this is not just true for ontologies. This is true for programming languages, and this is true for, uh, if maybe this is even true for, for many other engineering facts outside computer science. Right? But this, and this is a law that we have also observed. So from now on, I'm gonna go out on a limb. I'm gonna stick my neck out and you can chop it off afterwards if you want. And I'm gonna propose some of these laws that I think are more particular to the work of the last 10 year experiment, okay? So here's one. So the law says factual knowledge is a graph, okay? Um, so the dominant life form in information space for factual knowledge is a graph, right? And of course, we know this. Right? It means that uh, the vast majority of our knowledge is representable as uh, ground instances of binary predicates, right? And you and they link them up and together. You link them up and together, they they form a ground graph. Now this this is obvious to us, uh, <clears throat> and it's so obvious that you probably don't even think about it anymore. It's something that you need to discuss, but it is is not obvious at all to other communities. So for a database person. Um, ground, uh, factual knowledge is a table. And for a logician, factual knowledge is a set of sentences. Right? And uh, of course, I know that you can formally translate one into the other. You know, sort of every, every table is a simple graph. Right? And every graph, you can hack it into a sufficiently complicated table. Uh, and every graph you can write down as a set of sentences, as a rather trivial set of sentences, actually. And every, but it's, it's not quite true that every set of sentences is easily represented as a graph. So now the question is, well, who of these is the real dominant life form? Okay, and uh, I know on my uh, bold days, I think 
we, have, we are right, knowledge is a graph. If you look at these tables from these database people, all these foreign keys, they are just a trick to encode a graph in a set of tables. Right? So knowledge is a graph. So here's a less uh, controversial law, okay? Terminological knowledge is a hierarchy. So factual knowledge is a graph, terminological knowledge is a hierarchy. Right? And this is a law that has been rediscovered many, many times. Right? In pretty much any area of data modeling, knowledge engineering, knowledge representation, um, a hierarchical organization of types is what, what people come up with. And of course, this repeated uh, rediscovery uh, lends much credibility, lends much strength to this being a, a real law of the information universe. Um, so now I've, I've said a bit about terminological knowledge and uh, factual knowledge. So um, how do they relate? Well, obviously, to us, terminological knowledge is much smaller than factual knowledge. So the relationship between these two bubbles is actually something like this. Right? Um, and um, it's a small hierarchy ruling a big graph. Right? And again, this may sound obvious to us, um, but it hasn't been always this obvious. If you look at the history of uh, knowledge representation, pretty much all the work in knowledge representation has gone on in the small black bubble, right? It's been about representing generic, uh, generic rules, generic types, uh, terminological knowledge, the T-box, the if you want, right? And now it turns out our universe is really uh, uh, dominated not by the T-box, our universe is dominated by the A-box. Right? Uh, so our knowledge is lots and lots of really boring ground facts. So the, a lot of the power of our knowledge doesn't come from generic statements which are generically true about the world. No, a lot of the power of our knowledge comes from boring binary ground facts about this particular instance of the world, things that just happen to be true. And I think you could even make a point from cognitive science about this. A lot of our intelligence comes not from being smart in general, it just comes from knowing a lot of stuff, right? A lot of this big graph. And actually, we can be a little bit more precise about uh, the relationship between the small black circle and the, and the big white graph. So here are uh, uh, some numbers that some of you may have seen on the screen uh, yesterday when Jacopo Urbani gave his talk about uh, uh, distributed uh, backward chaining reasoning. And he did the following experiment. He took three of the largest data sets that we know. So LUBM is a synthetic data set that you can make arbitrarily large. Then linked live data, which is about uh, two and a half dozen large uh, life science data sets semantically integrated. Um, and uh, FactForge, which is a uh, DBpedia++. So it's a lot of encyclopedic knowledge. It's DBpedia plus the Internet Movie Database, plus music, plus et cetera, et cetera, Ge geography names, and so on, right? Um, and what he did is uh, he said, okay, I'll take the schemas of those things, so the, the small black circle, and I do the full complete forward closure, right? I, I compute all the inferences, and I see how long it takes. And doing the schema closure is measured in the order of seconds, right? Um, or a small number of minutes. And the second experiment was not only take the, the, black, the black circle, but enrich it with the big graph, and then do the closure over the whole thing. Right? And then suddenly the runtime is measured in hours. Um, and by the way, notice that we take here as somehow the measure of the size of these circles, not just counting the triples, but we're taking somehow uh, how complex it is to deal with them. Right? So how long does it take to do inference over them? I think that's a more interesting measure. Uh, of how large these circles should be drawn. And you see that there is a one or two orders of magnitude in, in difference in size between how much it takes to do inference over the white graph or over uh, the, the terminological knowledge only. So if we go back to the previous slide, right, it was like this, these numbers tell us that this slide should really look like this, okay? So this is how small our terminologies are compared to our factual knowledge. And it's very easy to imagine that you would blow up the, the, the factual knowledge, that it's very easy to imagine that you make this white graph bigger. 
But it's much harder to think how to arbitrarily make the black dot bigger, right? There's only so much terminological knowledge that you could possibly want to write down. Right, water. So the slogan here is, um, it's the A-box, stupid. Yeah? That's, that's where the power of our, uh, of our representations are. Um, and again, understanding this law um, helps us to, to design our artifacts. So it's exactly this insight that helps us to do our distributed uh, reasoning. Because we can see that because the closure is so small and the black dot is so small, we can easily replicate it across all our computing nodes. Now, it's small, you can keep it in memory everywhere. But that's a crucial key insight from this law that you need to know in order to make this informed uh, design decision. Okay. So, okay, let's look a little bit more at this notion of, uh, of how complex this terminological knowledge is, right? And the next claim is, of course, that terminological knowledge is not only small, there's little of it compared to factual knowledge, but it's also in very low complexity, right? So when we are looking at something like OWL, right? OWL is a, is a, it's, it's a, it's a strong, highly expressive uh, language. Um, but depending on where you look, uh, we either use such a, a big expressive language um, or, and that happens of course very often, we only use very small parts of it. Right? So somehow there is this unreasonable effectiveness of low expressivity knowledge representation. Right? It is much more ex uh, effective than you would have expected uh, based on, on, the, on the history of, uh, of AI research, for example. And of course it's nice that we have not only the small languages that we use a lot of the time, it is nice that we also have the expressive languages for the cases when we need it. Right? And there are cases when we need it. So it's not a, a, a one zero distribution. In a way, this is, you know, this is in a way its own ZIF distribution, right? That uh, the vast majority of ontologies are very uh, lightweight and then there is a, a, a tail of, uh, of heavyweight uh, ontologies. Um, and it's nice that we can use these expressive parts if we want to and there's even a bit more good news there that even though these expressive languages have very scary complexity measures, Right? In practice, those scary complexity measures, those worst case complexity measures, don't really hit us in practice. Right? So there was a beautiful talk yesterday by, uh, how, by a student from Manchester, I've forgotten your name, apologies, uh, about how to classify highly expressive uh, ontologies very efficiently. Right? In a way, laughing at the worst case complexity. The, the real case, the average case complexity is, is lower. And again, this is something useful to know when you are informing your, something useful to know when you are designing your artifacts. Yeah, knowing that worst case complexity bounds are just that, worst case complexity bounds. And apparently the information universe is not always worst case. Now, of course, this is a key topic in our um, uh, community, is uh, heterogeneity, right? And, and we know that heterogeneity is uh, unavoidable. Uh, and it's for good reasons that I chose the Tower of Babel as the metaphor for the vocabularies uh, that we write. Right? Um, and I think where something new that we have discovered, uh, different from other communities, is that uh, uh, it doesn't help to fight this heterogeneity. Right? Um, it's, it's fighting the inevitable. You might as well live with it. You might as well embrace it. And I think embracing this heterogeneity is exactly one of the things that has uh, enabled the rapid growth of the, the data sets and the vocabularies that we are publishing. And so this is, again, if you want a slogan, it's let a thousand ontologies blossom. Um, but of course, we know that embracing heterogeneity I mean, that's nice if you're publishing data. It's not so nice if you're consuming data, right? So if you're consuming data, then you need to somehow solve this heterogeneity. You want to make data interoperable. <clears throat> now, um, here I'm not sure if I'm a pessimist or an optimist, <clears throat> because I think this heterogeneity can be solved, but m maybe not in the way that, uh, that we would like to hear. Right? So I think most of this solving is not done algorithmically. Let me explain. 
So here's the picture that uh, we all uh, dream about at bed nights. Um, this is you know, the linked open data cloud, right? Uh, it's carefully handcrafted um, and cutest to the hard work that, that goes into every time crafting this, this picture. Um, but the picture is also somewhat misleading. I mean, unintentionally misleading, but still, because it somehow suggests this um, nice, uniform, distributed um, heterogeneity, which is nicely uniformly distributed across the space, right? This is really the let the thousand ontologies blossom picture. Um, but this is not really what the linked open data cloud looks like. Okay, so uh, just uh, measured last week, this is really what the, uh, what the current linked open data cloud looks like. Right? This was just run on the, of the same data set of the previous picture, but uh, now showing that there's a really high degree of clustering. And, uh, and the next picture is the same graph, but laid out in a little bit different way. Right, so it is really heavily lumpy, right? There are, there are clusters with lots of links inside the cluster and very few links between the clusters. And how did these clusters come about? Well, they are not, they don't come about by ontology mapping or engineering. They come about by social and cultural and economic processes. Right, so there are, in these clusters, um, there are central nodes. And why are these nodes central? Well, why, was, why is SNOMED so central? Well, because it was one of the first ones to be around. Right? Why will schema.org be so important? Uh, because it carries the weight of 90% of the search market. Right? So these are our social, cultural, historical reasons that cause this clustering to happen. Right? Um, and then inside these clusters, you have a good chance of doing ontology mapping. And it's necessary then to do algorithmic ontology mapping. And I think the, the, the state of the art of ontology mapping enables the algorithmic um, interoperability inside these clusters. But to be honest, the state of the art doesn't allow interoperability between these clusters. Right? We have nothing to say about links between these clusters in an algorithmic way. Um, and I think, I, I, I wonder if we ever will. So therefore my claim, al local heterogeneity resolution algorithmically, global resolution by culture and, and economics. Um, so th for the next point, we should realize that uh, we are not only a semantic web community, but we are a semantic web community. So we'll talk about uh, distribution, right? Um, and, and one of the original dreams of this community was to use the web as a data platform, right? So let's turn the web into a database, was one of the, the, the dreams, if you want. Uh, but it's actually, it's really tough. Uh, it's very hard. Um, this, the web is a very good distributed data publication platform, and, that has, and it is exactly this distribution aspect that has, again, allowed us to scale so well, both the web and the data web, uh, that people can it, it publish their data in a distributed way. But it, this, this, this same distribution puts a fundamental limit on how well we can consume uh, this data. And if you look at uh, where the world is going, then the world is going towards centralized consumption. So all the main applications of, of semantic web technology suck in a whole lot of data, massage it in some way, and then do interesting stuff on the centralized data set. And it's not just us. Now, what is Google doing? Right? Google is using our distributed publication and then doing their centralized computing. What is Facebook doing? It's the same. It's our distributed publication, and it's their centralized uh, computing. And I don't see how we will um, uh, avoid uh, being caught by the same uh, law. Right? The web is a distributed publication platform, but not a distributed uh, computing platform. OK, so if you take that law seriously, then you get faced with a problem. Then you have to do centralized computing. And how can you ever do centralized computing on these very large data sets? Well, of course, parallelization works. Parallelization doesn't always work. But the good news is that parallelization works in our case. And so um, I'll show you uh, two graphs, again, from experiments in our own lab. So this, is, um, this graph plots the behavior of a bunch of triple stores somewhere around 2009. Right, so they could uh, do inferencing over uh, a small number of billions of triples at the rate of tens of thousands of triples per second. 
Right? And uh, okay, there's some little some differences between them, but they're roughly all in the same ballpark. Um, they are all run on single machines, big machines, but single machines. Um, then we started to experiment with a, a distribution, and then we suddenly, no, suddenly, uh, in using the large knowledge collider, uh, we were we were up there, and uh, this is where those single machine applications were. Right? So they are, we were way out. It's not because we are smarter, of course not. It's only because parallelization works so well. Right? And this was in 2010. And then we worked for a year, and uh, more or less the algorithm stayed the same, but the engineering became better. And uh, now we're up there. Right? And, uh, and the single machine applications are still down there. Um, so parallelization works very well. You can ask yourself, well, why does it work so well? Well, it works so well because of some of the previous laws, right? Because terminological knowledge is small, it's low expressivity, you can do the closure, you can replicate it. Uh, the graph knowledge is a graph, factual knowledge is a graph, you can partition it, blah, blah, blah. So all of these laws, somehow they imply this one, namely that parallelization works so well in our case. So then I'll get to the, the final um, proposed law, um, knowledge is layered, right? <clears throat> and, um, and contrary to the other laws, I think this is a law that we have only been, been coming around to rather late in the game. Right? Um, and um, so we should think not just about our knowledge as a Tower of Babel, but more as a, as a Russian doll construction, right? With the dolls inside dolls inside dolls and towers inside towers inside towers. Um, and, and we could have known this, right? We could have known this from fields like cognitive science, from logic, from linguistics, from knowledge representation. All these fields tell you that some bits of knowledge refer to the world, right? but other bits of knowledge refer to bits of knowledge, right? So you could say that something is true in the world, a piece of knowledge, and then you could say something like the certainty of the previous piece of knowledge, or the origin of that piece of knowledge, or the trust you have in that piece of knowledge, um, or the time when somebody stated that piece of knowledge. Right? There's endless of these layers of knowledge, or the trust that you have in the time, what somebody said about the time when this was said. Right? And in our natural language, we do this all the time, but our current representation languages uh, serve us very badly in this respect. Right? Uh, and it's interesting, many papers here at the conference, they are really screaming for this kind of layering, and they are fighting themselves out of our current representation languages. And, and for, for lack of anything better, people are using, uh, clutching at named graphs, which is a horrible way to do layering. It's a good way to do partitioning, but it's not the same as layering. Um, and uh, I think being more aware of this law, that knowledge is layered, would help us in designing better uh, representation languages that better serve the needs of the, uh, of the applications. Right, final slides. We're wrapping up and then we have some time for questions. <clears throat> so I'll end with the same slide that I started with. Very impressive professor, but uh, does it work in theory? And of course, no, after this talk, the answer is yeah. theory, what theory? Uh, uh, we are not doing a lot of theory. Uh, we are not really, as a community, thinking at this meta-theoretic level. We are, we, are, we are building stuff, um, and then we are motivating our choices, uh, but we are not really looking for the universally emerging patterns. Right? Um, and, of course, I realize that, you, that many of you will disagree with, with some of the laws that I proposed. And maybe some of you will disagree with all of the laws that I proposed. And in a way, I don't even care, right? What I care about is that you start thinking about your work in terms of such laws, right? And whether it's these ones or other ones, that's our joint task to find out. Um, so this is a call to arms, if you want, for, say, for program committees um, or for editorial boards. Now to also be kind to papers who do this kind of, in a way, meta-theoretic uh, speculation or analysis, if you want, right? Um, and it's also a call to arms to you, everybody, 
right? So the next time you run your experiments and you write up your papers, try to separate the, what's incidental, what are the incidental choices that you happen to make from the universal patterns that maybe uh, we are together uh, discovering. Thank you very much. Okay. So Gus asked me if I would be so kind to uh, chair the question and answer session. Um, so any questions? And there are microphones around in the room. There's a first question right at the back. So uh, this is an amazing talk. Thank you very much for this great talk. And, and there was one thing that really caught my attention was uh, the web is a distributed publication platform, not a distributed computation platform. Right. And we realized that uh, the web now, we can see that. We have three major search engines and 90% is just one. And I personally think that with the semantic web, we can kind of make that computational power for everybody. So I personally don't agree that I, I would not want to see that the, that the computation is centralized. Um, but well, you, you say it is. Can you give me, do you have use cases where it doesn't have to be centralized? Right, so, so I, I agree with your point. So I also, I wouldn't like it to be that way. No, that's not necessarily an argument when you're fighting with the laws of the information universe. Um, and it could well be, I think in, in the beginning I said that uh, the way that we look at the laws are always uh, colored by uh, our current historical position, right? This was the guy in the distorted mirror. Right? And it could well be that uh, my, uh, you can distribute it publishing, but you can't do distributed computing, that that is too much colored by the current state of our technology. Now that I'm looking in a distorted mirror, and that's what I'm seeing, and that, uh, that <laughs> with future developments, either algorithmically or in hardware, that we would uh, free ourselves from this law. That could well be. The way I see the world now in my distorted mirror, and it's not just me, you know, it's like I say, it's, it's, it's everybody who does anything substantial on the web, and also in our community, it's centralizing. But it could be the distorted shape of the mirror today. Thank you. Um, yeah, just for your fitness, we make sure we maximally spread the questions across the room. So Natasha has a question right at the front. <laughs> So if you sort of continue the parallel with physics, you know, the physical laws, there are experiments that prove that these laws really hold in nature as far as sort of we can tell at any given time. So for the laws that you propose, do you f sort of treat them as a hypothesis that we still need to test it, or do you feel like the 10 years have been really sort of the experiment and we're done and these are the laws? And again, you know, as with physics, you know, they change sort of okay. for centuries as right. well. So this is a polite way of asking, do you really believe what you said, right? Uh, so of course the politically correct answer is uh, um, any, fra any um, formulation of a scientific law is always a hypothesis, even in physics, right? And just the last weeks with these neutrinos, we, we saw that that was true. Now, by the way, only the physicists can make headlines out of a measuring error. But, uh, um, so yes, there are always hypotheses, and I think these are, they are really hypothetical, right? And some of them I believe more strongly than others, and some of them have been bigger surprises than others. So I think, for example, I mean, the point that, that the first question made, this is a law that may well, law, yeah? that may well disappear because of changes in, in technology and instrumentation. I think this idea of the very, very, very small bl uh, black dot and the very large big circle, I think that is really saying something fundamental um, that we didn't know until 10 years ago. No, uh, AI wasn't telling us this, right? AI was, in any, if anything, it was all the work was in the very small black dot. Um, so I think that will be a one that I, where I really believe. The other one, I agree, those, the, the distribution one would be more tentative. There's a question there. This one? Uh, two. Yeah, yeah, well, both. I'll do first to, uh, yeah. 
Okay, so in the physical world, uh, we could say that almost all the data that we can handle or that we can observe is public. However, in the data information knowledge uh, physical world that you are uh, talking about, uh, there are many layers of uh, privacy and uh, publicness and privateness uh, of okay. what we can observe. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, how, how do you think that, is there a new law that we have to, to consider? I mean, in, uh, among the, uh, the, the set of laws that you have proposed, or? Uh, okay, so, so this is more a question about how we organize the process. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, I think maybe even in other sciences, it's less nice than you think. So if you talk to life scientists and, and chemists, and uh, their data isn't always public. Uh, um, so, uh, of course, the, the scientific process would be, ben would be most helped by having as much data as possible public so that we could all work on this reproducibility, that we could run parts of this experiment again and again and again. So, of course, it's true that it would be helped if all the data were public, but also we have to do this in, in, the, cur in, in the way we've economically organized the world. Um, and. Uh, Sometimes we work with data that has intrinsic value, and it's not for free. But I don't think that will be a, it may be a slowdown of the process, but it won't be a block on the process. Okay. So I think we'll just have to learn how to deal with that, and I think we can. Tom. Yeah, um, great talk, thanks very much. Um, so I have more of a kind of badly formulated observation than a, than a question, really. Um, which is that you start out by saying that you're a scientific realist rather than a constructivist. Yes. Um, but I think actually your laws reveal some kind of constructivist tendencies. <laughs> uh, and, um, now you have to uh, uh, illustrate that. Okay. Um, take, for example, the um, lovely visualization you did about the degree of interconnectivity between, between different data sets. Yes. Right. Um, I think that reveals, as you put it, some kind of universal laws of the information universe. Yes. But I think it also reveals some universal laws of the cognitive universe as well. And what I'd like to see next year is not just to talk about the laws of the informa information universe, but the laws of the cognitive universe as yeah. they apply to the semantic web. Yeah, I agree. It's, I agree. And it's, uh, so in a way, this is the distorted mirror again, right? So you're right that this being a, 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 a realist is a hopelessly idealistic position, you could, which you could never achieve. I guess that's the point you're making. The point you make is that whatever you see is always colored by the your cognitive lenses and your cognitive limitations, and not just mine, but ours as a species. Um, so certainly true, but that my philosophical position is that these are just the lenses that distort our view on an, on an externally existing or externally existing reality. Thanks. We'll continue in the over dinner tonight, right? <laughs> Better place for philosophy. Yes. Um, yes. The Michelle, go ahead. It's more like a philosophical question, and in fact, uh -oh. it continues. No, uh, it's a continuation of a previous discussion. Is that uh, you started with talking about the real, realistic, uh, you know, aspect of science versus the constructivist? I agree. I mean, I agree with everything you say, basically. But then, at the end, you go towards a, a call to arms for knowledge about knowledge. And that, to me, is more like a constructivist position uh -huh. than uh, uh, what you started with. So, do you have? I mean, I, I agree with pretty much everything you say. So, I, it's also a question to myself, like, you know, how do you reconcile the end of the with the beginning? Uh, okay, that's interesting. And, Avi, were you applauding? Yes. Uh, you agree with the uh, the question? Okay, so I disagree with both of you then, uh, um, because I think that it's, it's really a property of knowledge that, so, so, so I think of knowledge, I've been trained as a, as a mathematician and a logician, right? So for me, there's this referential theory of knowledge. So knowledge is stuff that refers to states of affairs in the world, right? But that's only the first layer of knowledge. There are other bits of knowledge that don't refer to states of affairs in the world, but that refer to bits of knowledge that refer to states in the world. I don't think there's anything constructivist about that. I think that is the way information is really structured. I don't think that is a mental construction of, of me. I think that's a real observation of how knowledge is. But I can see your point of view, and I, 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 this is more philosophical opinion than, than scientific fact. Uh, but I think both of the positions are tenable in a way, yeah, like so often in philosophy. 
Hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I see your point. I'm not sure you have convinced me. I'm not sure I have convinced you. <laughs> um, Amit had a question. Uh, Amit, uh, there? Ah, yeah, okay. Wonderful talk that uh, sort of tries to ground us. Uh, very nice. Um, possibly, uh, what you have tried to tease out is maybe colored a bit by what is the past. But if you observe, uh, at least in this one instance, um, we, in the web, we started with few people creating data. Now everybody, as in Web 2.0 and user-generated content, can create the data. So, uh, you know, uh, the same uh, thing might possibly happen with the computation. That as you see human being involved in the computation, everybody's connected, and in fact, every that means every node is actually a computer uh, node that can do computation. Uh, I, in that sense, I would posit that perhaps we are going towards really distributed computation okay. that was not possible before. Okay, so let me s uh, rephrase what you said just to see if I understood it, right? So you say, well, we now think of computation as something that happens apart from us, it's in a machine, but maybe we should rethink this idea of computing as a socio-technical system where humans are in the loop, and, uh, and this is now beginning to happen, and I know that you are also active in this space, and, and what you're saying is, well, maybe if we have this, uh, this, this other view on what computing is, then maybe it will also drastically change our view on some of these laws. Is that a, a correct rephrasing? Absolutely, and I think that um, that form of computation is likely to be much, much more powerful as we go on. Fine, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I agree. So this would be a good example of uh, how the alchemists really had to radically change their conceptual uh, schemas just by throwing stuff together in different ways. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can well imagine that that would happen. I think it's a good example. There's maybe time for one more question. There's just the one row uh, in front. And then, so, oh, oh, we never looked at that side. Okay, okay, <laughs> fine. So this was half of the questions, then we do the other half. Of the, you're right, okay, so please go ahead, yeah. Okay, so, um, so uh, you, you said so you were seeking a so salary, in its, but so on, on the other hand, so you also mentioned like, so, like heterogeneous is resolved by sociality or in the culture. Yeah. So that means, so I assume, so the semantic web is so, so going to not so like so uh, physics like or social science like ah, like, uh, yeah. like uh, economics, yeah. but yeah. in this yeah. sense, uh, there is so for example in economics right. there is a lot of school right. like so different yeah. theory and so they they yeah. always discuss. I think there's, the, yeah, there's a very nice link between yeah. your question and the previous one. Yeah? So it's not just about involving individuals in the loop, but also inv involving societies in the loop and yeah. culture. And I think this is a nice part of of, of web science. Is that it, it's well, we cannot we must look at the web also with this with the social science uh, glasses on. So yeah, I think that's a yeah, that's a good point. Okay, it, so there were questions there that I badly forgot. Uh, well, uh, Ivan, you had a question. Oh. Ah. Okay. So yeah, I think it's a very good point. Um, who has a question over there? No, I'm sorry, not. I have to stop. He gets the last question. Trust Chris. Right. So one of your laws was knowledge is a graph. Knowledge? Is a graph? Yes. But there, it seems to me there's a lot of kinds of knowledge that is clearly not a graph, like experiential knowledge. Did you mean knowledge that's a graph is a graph, or? <laughs> uh, see, trust Chris for misquoting you and trying to catch you out. I said, I said factual knowledge is a graph. Uh-huh. And that's, I, I, that's uh, already a more circumscribed. So uh, are you defining factual knowledge? <laughs> well, how about we do this over the coffee break? Okay. Thank you very much.